Um, so the challenges Walter's team uh, faces are not exclusive to one to exclusive. Um, capturing data from different sources, performing various kinds of analysis uh, for different clients, uh, ensuring that the data analysis is accurate, timely, and useful. This is a common challenge uh, across the companies, right? Uh, GCP offers many solutions that can help you, tangle, you know, uh, tame this problem and get the right set of insights for your business. So let's dive in. When people say Google, first instinct is to think of search. Um, and uh, with the original mission to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible, Google had to solve many technical uh, problems to be able to reach, you know, to build a service that can serve billions of people. Many of these technical challenges were necessary for search, but they're actually general purpose big data challenges. So we had to solve storage problem. We had a different types of data, and we need uh, different storage solutions for them, file systems, databases, key value stores, etc. We needed to process this data, and some of this data needed to be processed as a batch or as a streaming, right? Like they have different trade-offs. And finally, we needed to figure out how to serve our service, right? How can we um, deploy and update running service with no downtime? So over the time, our uh, infrastructure involved and our business involved. So now we have like, I think, eight services that have a, a daily reach more than a billion users. And with this growth, our technical infrastructure evolved as well, and uh, we are now able to support very different use cases. Yet, all of these use cases still share the same infrastructure, hardware, networking, and, and uh, software stack. In the last 15 years, we've published about inf our infrastructure and the tools we've built, um, starting with GFS and MapReduce papers, uh, Bigtable, Dremel, all the way to Dataflow and TensorFlow in the last few years. We've actively changed our Google infrastructure, but also influenced the industry. Now, many of these products have evolved into cloud offerings and unlocking this infrastructure to our external customers. We have a variety of products in compute, storage and databases space, big data, and machine learning. And uh, in the next few slides, I'll highlight the few that are relevant to Wouter's case. So microservices, as you heard, uh, give you flexibility to solve one problem at a time. They're easier to develop, test, and deploy. <laughs> that makes them a popular choice. However, maintaining microservices is not a trivial job. Right? You need to be able to scale them, upgrade them without downing time, and figure out when things go wrong. So this is where Google Container Engine comes to play. Container Engine uh, provides a fully managed container solution and allows you to de deploy uh, your de con containerized uh, uh, workflows. So we get a powerful cluster manager and orchestration system that uh, is built on top of open source Kubernetes. It's a pri it has a private container registry, so you have your own um, microservices well-defined and hidden. Convenient and powerful declarative API for resource uh, specification. And uh, because it's built on Kubernetes, which is open source, and there are many other uh, partners and companies out there who are using this, it actually allows you to combine both cl public client, uh, cloud and on-premise solutions. So using uh, something like a container engine and Kubernetes, you can have a, a hybrid cloud. Okay. The data warehousing is a huge part of every business, right? And uh, SQL is the you know, interface of choice to these data sets. In a, a Google Cloud Platform, if you have a data sets of uh, up to 10, petabyte, uh, 10 terabytes, you can use Google Cloud SQL. With it, you get a fully managed and reliable um, uh, SQL service built on Postgres or MySQL uh, that comes with automatic failover and optionally high availability mode. You do not have to upgrade your database. You do not have to monitor it all the time, right? Like we ensure that nothing happens to your machine and the things just run. It's a performance and scalable up to 10 terabytes to 25,000 IOPS and uh, it comes with automatic encryption and uh, you have a full control over firewall settings and you can uh, protect your access to the database. Uh, being MySQL and Postgres, it has a strong partner ecosystem. However, if your data set grows to more than 10 terabytes you still, you, and you still want to use SQL, we do have a solution for that, and it's a Google Cloud BigQuery. BigQuery is a fully managed, low-cost, serverless data warehouse. You never see the machines. You just go to the website and enter your queries, right? 
Uh, it, has, uh, it exposes SQL interface. It has a seamless scalability from gigabytes to petabytes. And it's secure and reliable. Again, automatic encryption, automatic replication. All of this happens behind the, the uh, curtains. You don't see it. You just use the service. However, even with BigQuery scale in performance, there are problems that require sort of guaranteeing low latency and uh, consistent uh, throughput, which is hard to guarantee with a, a SQL service. Right? So for this case, we have a Google Cloud Bigtable. This is a NoSQL big data database that powers many of the products you probably use. Uh, search, analytics, maps, Gmail, it's behind all of that. It's, again, fully managed, no SQL database. Um, you don't get to see the machines, again, in, for all practical purposes. It has a beta scale uh, uh, scalability uh, with a very low latency. And uh, it can grow the throughput as needed. The interesting thing with Bigtable is, depending on your access patterns, it learns and adjusts to them. So over the time, your serving becomes more efficient. So we looked at some of the storage solutions. Now you have this data. You want to process it. Many of you are coming from, non, uh, from existing frameworks that may have been built on open source tools like Apache Hadoop or Spark. Right? We want you to be able to reuse these tools in your applications. So we have a Google Cloud data proc offering. And this is a stateless uh, data proc gives you stateless clusters that can spin up in the seconds up to a minute and can read and write the data to uh, various sources like GCS, Bigtable, BigQuery with uh, HCFS and HBase compatible connectors. Um, it also provides convenient API for management of both clusters and jobs. So with Dataproc, you can choose whether you want to run your Dataproc cluster as a long living cluster with HDFS and everything in it on it. Um, like you did on-premise or another cloud provider, or you can take a you know a benefit of a low latency that we have for startup starting clusters and run a job per cluster and just bring down the cluster when your job is done. So, DataProc is great, but we learned a few things in data processing in Google. So, petabyte scale processing engine Google Way is our cloud data flow. Um, many of um, uh, the data flow took many of the internal learnings and turn them into a data, uh, data processing solution that scales uh, both for batch and streaming workloads. It is fully managed and auto-configured. You can start data flow jobs but not specifying much, anything much than uh, code. Um, and uh, it, comes with a, it provides unified batch and streaming processing model. Um, so you write your tr data transformations once, and depending on input source and output source that you use, we have a streaming pipeline or we have a batch pipeline. So if you're consuming PubSub, voila, you're having streaming. If you're consuming GCS, you're reading the batch. Right? And we open source the Dataflow SDK uh, and turned it into Apache Beam project uh, in the last year. So we scale to petabytes of data, millions of QPS automatically, and we invested a lot of time in high quality integrations with GCP. Oops. <laughs> uh, Google Cloud Platform ensures seamless integration of these powerful tools. You can use any one of them and be perfectly happy. But the real power of the platform comes from using them together and providing a comprehensive solution that's well integrated with monitoring, debugging, alerting, and all of these other things. And this is where GCP excels. So with this, let's go back to business intelligence case. Thank you, Jana, for the great overview. So we ended with this slide. Um, so it's a quick recap before we want to go. I'm going to start with our original architecture, um, like I encountered it uh, in 2013 when I started and how it still lives. So we have a monolithical.NET application on top of a SQL cluster. And for reporting purposes, we copy the data every night to a separate reporting database so that the analysts don't bring down production. That's pretty obvious. Most of the analysis happens um, in Excel using queries that they write directly on the database. Um, and then me and Alex, my uh, tech lead, came in. And we started to um, push most of our really large data sets into the cloud, into BigQuery. Mostly, this is email. We send about 2 million emails per day. And we have about five rows of data, potentially, per email. So that's quite a lot of rows. Click tracking is also up to 20 million rows uh, on a single day. SQL couldn't manage that, but BigQuery does it fine. Um, we also copy production data through cloud storage into BigQuery so that our analysts can um, 
can enrich the data that they get from these streams with the data from production. Of course, um, with one day of delay. We've adopted Tableau as the new tool to uh, analyze data uh, as a replacement to Excel. <clears throat> and uh, it's bringing the data that we have in, in, in SQL and in BigQuery to pretty much everyone in the company through very nice looking dashboards. So, that's, so we're already qu quite data driven. Um, lastly, personalization is also a part of my team. Um, it's what our data scientists do. And they run it in PySpark on top of Cloud Dataproc. So we are using the stateless version of what Yelena explained. Um, we provision, we spin up a, serve, uh, a, a cluster um, at night. We do our calculations, um, which import data from Cloud Storage and BigQuery. And the results go back into Cloud Storage. Um, and then we copy it back over to production. This is a big pain point, because um, we generate a lot of data out of, um, out of Spark. This can be really millions of rows. Um, and the copying takes quite a long time. So this is a really big pain point. To the new architecture then, because that's what, why you're here for. Um, the new architecture will be Angular frontends on top of uh, .NET Core microservices running in containerized uh, Linux environment in Kubernetes. Um, all of them have their own MongoDB database, so no SQL, or in some cases, Cloud SQL. I'm not going to go into much detail about Kubernetes and containers because I'm, I'm like the BI guy. But if you have any questions, feel free to, to come up after the show. This is a very basic back office screen like we have it today. I hope you can read it. I'm not sure. But what this shows is for our employees inside one of those deals that we have, all of the products, their name, price, stock information, how many orders we've had so far, how many views we had, so that they can have some kind of an indication of conversion. And they use this to intervene in live sales. Now, to make this screen in our new environment, we're gonna, the UI will have to contact four different microservices and BigQuery. It's going to be horribly complicated. So my team said, look, we will just provide you with a microservice which gives all of that data as a single JSON payload, and we'll figure out where to get the data and how to merge it. So how do we get the data? Microservices, obviously, they talk to each other. They use direct endpoint calls, but also asynchronous events. So let's say you have a member service, a new member registers, it sends an event, and some kind of other service which is responsible for sending out our welcome mail says, hey, new member, I'm going to send a mail um, without needing a direct call. Now, we require all of our microservices to send out events for the entities that they manage internally, being it a product, an article, uh, a member, an order, and each time these things get created or modified, we send events over Cloud PubSub. And all of those events are read by Dataflow and stored into Cloud Bigtable, so that my team's BI environment has a perfect copy of what is happening in the microservices. How we do that in practice? We use Google Protocol Buffers, which is a very nice technology for making these kinds of events. So you define them as a schema. And from that schema, you generate the serialization code in most common programming languages. And they end up being serialized in very small, very efficient binary files, which go over the PubSub bus, are read by our streaming data flow, and we just store them in Bigtable as binary. So no deserialization happens in this flow. It's actually a very simple flow. Bigtable is really nice because, um, as Yelena said, you can reach very high throughput, very low latency, um, it, which is what we need, because we're going to be firing a lot of events. And a nice feature as well is that when you write a cell into BigQuery, it's timestamped. And every older version of that cell is kept. So we not only have a copy of our microservice environment, but we also know the entire history of everything that, ev that, that ever happened. So all of the email address changes that users did, um, changes to orders, modifications to addresses, all of those things are kept. We can roll things back, and we can um, replay history if we want. How do we bring the data back? Bigtable is not for reporting. It's a key value store. So we use um, our own microservices written in Python or Google Go to read the data out of Bigtable and serve it to back office screens, other microservices where needed. The really large data streams, as before, go straight into BigQuery. It doesn't make sense to fire those into Bigtable. So we've got our data in MongoDB, Cloud SQL, we've got our external data in BigQuery. What we want in the end is analyst data and production data. So the production data is to, to do things like that back office screen that I've shown you. And analyst data is 
the raw entity data, all of our users, all of our orders, all of our returns, but also that pre-processed data that we were talking about. So the turnover we did on a sale last year and the unique visitors we had. So how do we do that? How do we use the, the intermediate technologies like PubSub, Dataflow, and Bigtable to get there? Well, it depends a bit on the scenario, but we, we see like four patterns or strategies um, that we use in combination to, be, to, to get there. So one of them, I have two real-time strategies and two batch mode strategies. Um, the first real-time strategy is to read from different PubSubs at the same time, combine the data in Dataflow, and bring that to Bigtable. Um, an example? We get new users in every day, but our analysts don't just want to know how many new users we had, they also want to know where did they come from and what kind of device that they used. The member service will send us an event about a new user, but that doesn't contain that information. That they need from the click stream, which is another PubSub stream. So we read both, we combine the data, and we store that final output in Bigtable. We need to do it like that because when we're reading the click stream, we can't assume that the member entity will already be in Bigtable. Another strategy is to read data from PubSub, process it in Cloud Dataflow, and load side information from Bigtable. For example, when you want to calculate the unique visitors per country, our click stream tells us that, who's clicking where, but it doesn't tell us what the country of that user is. So we ask Bigtable to tell us the country, we generate our KPI, and we store it in Bigtable. So that's the second strategy that I will demonstrate at the end if I have enough time. Um, that screen that we talked about, that back office screen, will actually already be a combination of both strategies to make that possible. Then batch mode, here we will read data, mostly from, from BigQuery, also from Bigtable. We combine it, calculate it in Cloud Dataflow, and the end result goes back, in, back into Cloud Bigtable. If we do a lot of processing for various kinds of reports, things that people often need, that the analysts need pre-calculated, that will be mostly this example. For example, an email campaign report, that's a lot of email click data that comes from BigQuery. It's enriched, because this data is pretty bare, the email tracking data, enriched with memory information, and the results go into Bigtable. And as before, this, the data science stuff goes into stateless cloud data proc, but instead of reading from um, SQL as we do today, we read from Cloud Bigtable, and the results also go back to Cloud Bigtable so that we can very fastly provision this data into production without needing to copy it over again to an SQL server as we did before. Where the data ends up in the end depends on who needs it. If we need it in the back office or in production, we serve it through a microservice and the data resides in Bigtable. Um, if our analysts need it, we create a data set in Bigtable, and depending on the frequency required, hourly, daily, weekly, we use a data flow to stream this data into BigQuery or Cloud SQL. Well, both actually, so that people can join the stuff in, in BigQuery with these huge data sets, because the really large data sets, like our click stream and email stream, we will just enrich them with Bigtable data and store the result in BigQuery as really large, denormalized data sets. What if things go wrong? And they do, and they will. Um, we back up all of our events, so all of the events are also read from PubSub by a dedicated backup streaming data flow, which stores all of them, again as binary, into BigQuery. There's an additional batch job which copies it to cold storage just in case somebody wants to delete the table in BigQuery. Um, restoring happens by using the same data flows. Streaming or batch doesn't matter. A streaming can be run as batch too. And we change the input from originally PubSub to BigQuery, which contains exactly the same binary protocol buffer files. And we store the corrected information again in Cloud Bigtable. So now for the demo. Uh, do we have time? Yes, we have time. So um, this is a very simple data flow um, that I've built specifically for, for showing it here to demonstrate a little bit of what we are doing. So, um, it's on our actual production data today because all of what you, I've been explaining to you, it's not done yet, we're building it. Um, but we've, of course, tested a lot of these things conceptually. So I'm going to write our current production data as event sources over Cloud PubSub. I'm going to count them, but from the click stream, I don't know the country, so I'm going to get the country um, from Bigtable. And I'm going to store the result as a time series again in Cloud Bigtable. And I will use a simple Node.js bare bones web service to show that um, on a browser screen. So let's have a look. Can I switch to the computer? Oh, yeah. So um, when you load your data flow um, in Dataflow, 
in the interface, in the runner online, you get a very nice overview in blocks of what your pipeline is actually doing. So it starts with reading from PubSub. It's windowing it, in this case, in one minute windows. We do some internal conversion to a clause that we can use in Java. We filter it, and then we count the views. And within that, we first get that country from Bigtable, and then we count the actual views. Uh, that gets converted into a mutation, which is then finally committed to Bigtable. And the interface is really nice. You can see how many workers um, are, are doing the job. Can you actually read that? Yes, one. Um, you can check logs, look for exceptions if anything is going wrong. It's a really nice interface. Now, pops up. I can't show you much about that, but what I can show you is Stack Driver, which um, shows us how many events are coming in. So, currently, we have a good 100 events per second uh, going through, well, going through the pops up channel. Um, if I show you that per day, you see the typical morning and evening peak that that our website has. So, we're seeing events. Now, what kind of events are those? This is our website. Um, Let's say I'm interested in shoes. I'm actually doing this over a phone because the Wi-Fi wouldn't cooperate, so bear with me. Um, so I'm going to show a few products. Put one in my cart. Um, now in BigQuery, they look like this. I'm going to refresh this. Um, now BigQuery is really nice for these very deep tables. So this is a table of probably a good 10 million rows now. Um, it has some setup time in the beginning because your query gets dispatched over X amount of machines and then the results come back. Um, so it takes a few seconds, but then it goes very quickly. Um, so you see here I have a product views, I have a light updated. Um, I have device identifiers, session identifiers. This is that user identifier that I will be using. And we also store some additional unstructured data in JSON uh, to mostly to optimize things like uh, recommender engines and such things. So finally, um, what is this going to look like? Um, Bigtable, I can't show you much of Bigtable, but this is how it looks if you, <laughs> if you uh, talk to it uh, using a command line interface. So I'm going to get the, the last few events. And here you see uh, my time series. Oh, can you read that? Here you see my time series. So you see the events, uh, the page views for Belgium, Luxembourg, and Netherlands uh, being written per minute and with a timestamp. So you see when the, the data was being written into Bigtable. So this is how it looks like. So you see my one minute time series that was generated by Dataflow. And to show you the real, real timeness of the thing, um, I've instructed Dataflow to update my latest window every few seconds. So these are the actual events that's coming on our website right now. It's not fake. Um, and voila, this gives you an idea of how you can use Cloud Dataflow to use these kinds of things. So back to Yelena. Okay, thank you, Wouter. Uh, so to summarize, today we've seen uh, and explored the event exclusives uh, business intelligence use case. We looked at the GCP products that make this use case easier to manage, and uh, we also seen a pretty cool demo. I'm still baffled like that we're looking at the production data. Like, it's, it's neat. <laughs> um, we hope that you will recognize similarities between problems that you're facing and uh, uh, problems that uh, Wouter's team uh, tried to solve and that some of these will inspire you on how you can combine the services we have to provide a solution that works for you. Um, and uh, at that, this point, like, we are very happy to take any questions you may have. Uh, we ended up being a little bit faster than we expected. So lots of questions. And I have some stickers, if anyone wants. <laughs> uh, only for the ones who ask questions. <laughs> Do you want to repeat? Yeah. yeah uh, the question was, do you have, uh, on top of the, the technical stack itself, on mm -hmm. the big da -da -da, uh, so, uh, do you have these business uh, scenarios or use cases somehow uh, captured into, say, templatized formats, like certain business cases or specific types of use cases? 
we, we do have a couple of things for this. Uh, on cloud.google.com slash big data, there are templated like uh, examples of a different business use cases. I think we have uh, six or nine. I know there are three at Coleman, but I don't know how many rows we have. Um, all of them uh, have a code in uh, GitHub, so you can actually see how the code looks like. And many of them are integration between uh, different products, uh, because it's like in a big, da a big, a big data space. Uh, we also have a ton of uh, data sets that are available through BigQuery or on GCS that you can use to sort of explore the ideas that you have. Um, so yeah, so there is some documentation in some of the examples there. Um, we um, also offer some trainings for these things. And um, I believe if you're interested in that, I can find more information. I don't know it on top of my head. Uh, but we definitely continually uh, build this uh, database of the sort of white papers and examples. Uh, and I think very recently we had a, like I think this week or Friday last week, we had a publication by one of our um, uh, SME subject matter experts, uh, Reza, um, on the best practices when using the big data tools. And that will be ongoing series. So he published the first part last week. Yes. So thanks for your presentation. Um, maybe a question for, uh, for Walter. Um, how do you deal with um, uh, a personally uh, identifiable information that comes from your website in regards to the, the, the nature of Bigtable, which stores every record and also every mutation of every record, um, especially now with the GDPR uh, uh, coming, coming, coming up? So my question is very general. How do you deal with that? It's a very good question. Um, and we've, we've thought about it a lot. Now what, what Cloud Platform really allows you to do really well is, is, is set permissions uh, on a technology level, so each service you can keep it away from people, you can use specific service accounts, so we don't want any analysts talking to our big table. We also don't want any, um, not even other developers talking to our big table or other microservices. We, we keep that inside our own team um, and we get to, to say what we export to the databases that allow them to generate reporting. Because they can't use Bigtable, they can only use Cloud SQL or Bigtable uh, or BigQuery. So there we can use separate tables. So that's that's a bit the idea that we're going to use. We're going to we're going to um, pull all of the information that's really personally identifiable uh, in different tables, and they would need to join it together to know who it really is. And only some people, like in customer care, uh, can do that. Uh, it will be done in their back office. They will get the rights to do that, but most people will not be able to. Because you don't need to know that information to do most of your work anyway. Is that kind of an answer to your question? Um, it is. Uh, but that's the question for you then. Okay. Um, Thanks again. Um, so, is there, um, can you specify in, in Bigtable a, a, a type of retention period? Uh, so, so, the GDPR specifies that some type of data you will have to delete in, uh, in, in a maybe two years or five years, depending on the type of data. Um, uh, can you set a retention period, or is that, is that a thing you have to, um, have to add a little process in your flow to take care of that? So that's an excellent question. So do we have capabilities to automatically remove the data after a certain period of time? And uh, I would have to look up what a big table exactly sets. I know we do have these support for these things, for example, in Dataflow. Uh, and we, we have a services for this in Google, so you register, and if the information is deleted, you have to yank it out of your system. So specifically for Bigtable, I don't know, but I can look it up. Uh, and, uh, but we definitely care and, you know, about the data, and we, very well know, uh, we are very well aware of the data policies. So this is but, something we care about. But on the GDPR, um, we are currently working with, with consultants who are specialized in this, and even they don't know how it's going to be. So it's going to be with the EU cookie law. Um, some big players are going to make the first moves, and the rest will kind of standardize on that. Um, and, and it's also not, it's not that clear cut. You don't have to delete the data, they tell us. You have to anonymize it. So you have to delete someone's name and email address, but you can still keep views and orders. And some data you will even need to keep, like an invoice, you will need to keep that forever in your database, which is also personally identifiable information. So it's it's mo much more complicated than that. It's, it's true, but being in a big player, we tend to be the first one being uh, 
for you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so my question is for Walter. Uh, I was listening to your presentation, and I think it's nice. Um, but what for me was missing was that I want to believe that this journey has not been all roses. And if there has been any hurdles uh, that you've encountered in this process that you want to share that uh, would be as an example for anybody who wants to be on this migration uh, journey. Well, I think one of the main hurdles, if you see what kind of evolution we, we went through, is, is getting to grips with the different breeds of technology that Google has. Um, Bigtable is really a, a very different kind of database than an SQL database. Um, and if you look at it, it says it, it looks as if you simply cannot do much with Bigtable. You read rows, you scan rows, and you write them, and that's it. But their schema design is absolutely essential for what you want to do. So you, you need to spend more time thinking about such things. So, and, and there's also a lot of yeah, mistakes that you make, beginner mistakes. Um, the first uh, data flows that we wrote, yeah, that didn't go over roses. We needed to get to grips with the technology. So you need to invest a lot of time in learning. And, and I hope your company allows you to do that uh, because you will spend some time, um, yeah, trying things out. <laughs> but presumably it's worth it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay, there's a question. Uh, Walter, thank you for the presentation. Um, how big is your team uh, uh, which um, think, thought is true and built, uh, built the implementations? The complete IT department is um, between 40 and 50 people, I don't know exactly. Uh, and my department is, is, uh, is just seven people. But I think there, there were some key people in there, our, our architects like uh, Alex, who's here up, up front. Um, it's, it's, it's his brainchild that I'm presenting here. So he did a marvelous job. So if you want to congratulate him or ask him more in-depth questions. Uh, he's actually one of the only Google development experts in Belgium, or the only one for cloud. Not anymore. And he works for us. So we're very happy with that. <laughs> that helps a lot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> OK, thanks. Question for uh, Walter: uh, Why and how did you choose uh, Google Clouds? What, what was the decision tree? Very good question. Now, as you've seen, we're not a big company. We're not a bank. We're not a, uh, a big retailer. And, and when I came into the company, we were only like 90 people. We're, we're three times that. And so it was a 20 people uh, IT team, and and yeah, two guys taking care a little bit of BI. So we we had no time or resources to compare 20 different providers, technologies, and whatnot. So um, the decision was based on a few things. Um, one of them was we had a very good relationship with, uh, with Google because we, are, we, were a, we were a top AdWords client. Um, we've got people with a lot of experience with Google technology, like, like Alex. Um, but I think one of the main reasons was that Google has these technologies that Yelena has been showing us. Things like BigQuery, I mean, three, ter three years ago, we were baffled by the, the power that thing has. and this. This, this pushed us over the edge, and, and also the fact that everything can be done in a managed way. I mean, you can run Redshift, you can run Kafka, but you still have to do a lot of management of all of the servers that run below these things. And we simply do not have the resources to do that. If we, if we need to do that ourselves, it will take us two years just to build the infrastructure. So that was one of the key reasons for us to do it like this, because with a very small team, we can do really powerful stuff. Any other questions? I'm sorry? Can you use, can you use the mic? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, did you make use of a Google partner, or was it completely your team that... Uh, um, for this, not. Um, though for the original architecture, we did kind of, well, the first steps into BigQuery three years ago, we talked a little bit to Datatonic, who's here and has a booth, uh, and I think went into cloud data platform because of us. <laughs> uh, so we had some chats straight in the beginning to, to confirm some of the, of the big bets that we were taking. Uh, but that's about it. The rest is, is made in-house. OK. 
Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming and uh, you can grab us after this. <laughs>